All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Psalms in Hebrew and Comparative Translations. We meet on Tuesday mornings at 10 by Zoom, and we're welcome to anybody who wants to come. Uh, you don't have to be a member of the congregation. You don't have to be Jewish. You can just be an interested person who wants to study Psalms together, and we're thrilled to be able to do that. Um, the the first two psalms that we looked at way back in November can actually, some scholars have, have described those two psalms as being actually one psalm. Uh, that's one, one traditional Jewish approach that's contained in the Talmud. Um, another way to think about those two psalms is that they are a coda, like an introduction to the whole um to the whole project of the book of psalms the uh first psalm had the theme of uh of learning and studying torah that a righteous person spends time studying torah which i think I mentioned in our first class, nicely connects both to the very end of the the five books of Moses, our Torah, where it says, where Moses charges Joshua to study the Torah day and night. And it also connects to the very beginning. So the, the Hebrew Bible, Hebrew scriptures is divided into three books. Torah is the five books of Moses. That's the first section. Nivi'im, prophets, is the second section, and Kituvim, writings, is the third section. And so Torah, T, Nivi'im, N, Kituvim, Ch, that comes together to be Tanakh, and that's why we call the Hebrew Bible Tanakh. And so uh, the, the first book of Nivi'im, of prophets, is Joshua, and Joshua begins with the exhortation to study Torah. And then the first book of Kituvim, of writings, is Psalms. And Psalms also uses the exact same words of the importance of studying Torah. So we see that each of the sections of the Bible refer back to the Torah itself. So that's the first psalm. And the second psalm uh, has the theme of the Davidic sovereignty in Jerusalem, in Zion. And the, the idea, I think, of these two psalms together is that you, you, if you start out your process of learning, uh, of, learning of, of relating to psalms, with the idea that righteous that righteousness comes from study of the Torah, and that justice can come uh, through this Davidic uh, monarchy, right? Then you've got this sort of righteousness and justice, which in some sense is sort of the mission of the Jewish people. One way to characterize the, the what God says to Abraham when God starts the Jewish people is that your your mission is to do la sot tzedakah umishpat. Your mission is to do uh, uh, justice and righteousness, to so laws and, 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 and justice. And, and so that's sort of, I think, the way in which those two Psalms are an introduction to the book of Psalms. Now, today we're gonna look at the third Psalm and the third Psalm begins sort of the next section one traditional Jewish way of describing the sections of Psalms is that Psalms 3 through 14 are a chunk. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to look at each of those Psalms individually, but we're also going to be thinking about in what way is Psalms 3 through 14 a conceptual unit? What are the themes that are running through these Psalms? And are there other conceptual units? Are there other ways to conceive of these, uh, of of the relationships between these psalms? Now, um, 
this morning's psalm has a, a few uh, aspects to it that I'd like to uh, raise up right before we go into the the translations. But I'd like to read the psalm in Hebrew, which has been our uh, our custom to begin our study of the psalm by hearing how it sounds in Hebrew. Can you see this? Yes. All right. So we're up to the third psalm, and I'm going to read it out loud. Mizmor le David bevorcho mipnei av shalom beno. Adonai marabu tsarai rabim kamim alai. Rabim omrim le nafshi ein yeshuata lo velohim sela. Veata Adonai magain baadi kivodi umerim roshi. Koli el Adonai ekra vayaaneni mehar kodsho sela. Ani shachavti vaish ani shachavti vaishana he kitsoti ki Adonai ismech ismecheni. Lo ira me rivavot am asher saviv shatu alai kuma Adonai hoshieni elohai ki hikita et kol oivai lechi. Shine Rishaim Shibarta. La Donai Ha Ishua Ala Mecha Birchatecha Sela. I think that there's something about reading the psalm out loud where you get a sense for its parsing, for its uh for its pacing, for the sort of internal rhymes of it, for the sense of um the sense of who is speaking and who is being spoken to, like the aspects which are second person and which are first person. So I, I just wanted to to raise up that this is the first of our lament psalms. Many of the psalms that we're going to look at over the course of the time that we study psalms together will be psalms of lament. Psalms of lament have a specific discernible structure. They have an invocation, right? Who the psalm is talking to, or what the context of the psalm is. So, right, we got um, the first verse is that invocation, right? A direct address to God. Then we get the complaint or the lament. The, what is the psalmist upset about, right? Here, David is talking about all of the enemies all around him. And specifically, the, this psalm is understood to be deeply rooted to a historical moment, to a moment where David is running away from Absalom, his son. Uh, then, really? then the 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 after the lament, there's an expression of confidence in God. Uh, that's right here. Um, uh, we we see that in in uh um verses six and seven. Uh God's God God is there, God is protecting, God there's confidence in God. Finally, there's a petition. Uh that's in verse eight. Right? God beat my enemies, right? It's it's not enough that you're just there for me. I'm confident in you. You're gonna beat my enemies. Go ahead and beat them. And then uh, in verse 9, we see uh, an expression of praise of God. And, and so this psalm is a very good example of a lament psalm because it has all of the pieces. Not every single lament psalm has all of the elements of this structure. Um, sometimes the invocation is very short. Sometimes the invocation is a little longer. Sometimes the confidence in God section is a little uh, short. Oh, they, you, you can, so um, we're going to look at other lament psalms, but this one is a good one to start with because it's got all the elements. Um, what As we go through our translations, you're going to see that some of the translations count the verses differently in this psalm. And the reason is the Hebrew scriptures understand the uh, the first line, the title, 
Mizmorla David Bevorcho Mibne Avshalom Beno, right? The title of the psalm as the first verse of the psalm. That's the traditional Hebrew way. We don't have lines in our scriptures that are not given verse numbers, but in many of the Christian Bibles, uh, that line is just understood to give you context. It's sort of like this line is in italics, uh, and 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 it's the title of the psalm, or it's you know bolded in the middle of the page, and the first verse is what 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 we've titled verse two. Um, that's when the psalm really starts. So I just point this out because as we go through our translations, you're going to find that there's a discrepancy there. All right. Does anyone have any uh, thoughts or questions before we jump in to the translation? Great. My hope is that we do some of the translations and have a conversation. And I really want to get to, at the very end of uh, page six of the handout for this week, there's a section on sort of spiritual uses of this psalm. And I, I'd really like to spend a little bit of time on that. So that's my goal. All right. Let's jump into some of the translations. Um, here we have... Um, two Jewish translations of the psalm. Uh, one is Robert Alter, and uh, and the other is uh, Richard Levy. And uh, is there somebody who'd like to read uh, the, the left-hand column, the Robert Alter translation? Which one is which? It says at the bottom, but the left-hand column. Oh, then I, I would. This again. All right, go ahead, Alba. On the left, translation by Robert Alter, a, da a David Psalm, when he fled from Absalom, his son. Lord, how many, how many are my foes, many who rise up against me, many who say of my life, no rescue for him through God. And you, Lord, a shield are for me, my glory, who lifts up my head with my, eye, my voice, I cry out to the Lord. And he answers me with his holy mountain. Oh, I forgot the Selah above. Selah, I lie down and I sleep. I awake for the Lord has sustained me. I fear not from myriads of troops that round about set against me. Rise, Lord, rescue me, my God. For you strike all my foes on the cheek and teeth of the wicked you smash. Rescue is the Lord's on your people, your blessing. Selah. All right. Any comments on the psalm before we read it? Any other translations? Yeah, Gary. Can we talk about? Oh, oh sorry. Alba. Yeah. Uh, Alba, what? Gary yeah. Westford. Okay. Gary. Um, I had not been aware until I looked at the Hebrew uh, that Absalom looks at least to me like father of peace. Is that what it is? Yeah. So, right. Great. I'm glad you brought that up because. Also, um, uh, Marv mentioned that the names in the Psalms and in the passage from 2 Samuel that I recommend reading is uh, is there are a lot of different names and it's hard to keep track of everyone. But David has several children. One of them is named Avshalom. Avshalom means father of peace or my father brings peace or God like is peace, where Av, the word father, refers to the divine father. Um, and uh, when you look at Av Shalom's life in the, in scripture, right, he, it, it's an ironic name, because he certainly doesn't have peace with his father. He is not a uh, in, he does not engender peace in the world. He does not like bring forth God's peace. In fact, right? I, in some ways, he's a foil to Shalomo, Solomon, whose name also comes from the word peace, right? Av Shalom, Shalomo, right? And so I think we're supposed to read from a sort of literary perspective, 
this son of David as a corruption of peace, whereas the 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 son of David that will end up being the next king, Solomon, does uh is sort of the 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 peace bringer in some sense. And I and I do think that that's relevant uh to our understanding of Second Samuel. And I also think it's relevant to this uh psalm, which is part of why the the Jewish way of seeing this this uh introduction that this this uh a David psalm when he fled from Absalom his son it's not just the title it is the first verse because if you think of it as the title then you might not think oh this is also about peace right you might not it might not occur to you to think about the meaning of that name as being a clue to what this uh to what this psalm is about but i do think that there is something there Thank you, Gary. Uh, Alba. Yeah, the word Selah, is this a word that has orth uh, orthographic? Um, whoops, there it went. Great. So, <laughs> uh, 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 qualities like a period or a comma or a pause or ellipse, and yeah. also a word. Right. So the word, so yes, it the word Selah has no clear meaning uh, jps says describes it as a liturgical direction of uncertain meaning a lot of folks think that this that this word cued in the chorus so if you were singing this psalm in liturgy or in the temple the word sella might have cued in the instrumental part or the or the or the chorus the 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 symphony part right so you read this section and then you say oh sella and it brings in the the musical instruments and so that's why it says a liturgical direction but it could also mean you know bow here but they don't think that's what it means but but the but the so the word is it's uncertain what it means i did bring you one uh classical jewish commentator the Radak, uh, on the word Sela, and he writes, the majority of commentators say of the word Sela that it is the equivalent to Le'olam, forever. And so, Jonathan, when he says Jonathan here, he's referring to the Targum, the the, the translator into Aramaic, Targum, Targum Yonatan. So the whole Bible is translated into Aramaic, uh, and there's actually, we have two or three different translations into Aramaic. And so he says, and so the, the Targum Yonatan renders the word Sela in the prayer of Habakkuk. So if you go to, if you go to the minor prophet Habakkuk and you look uh, at the, at the, the word Sela, it's translated there in the Aramaic into Le'almin, which means forever, Le'olam, Okay. And in this sense, the word is common in our prayers. And the learned uh, Rabbi Abram ben Ezra, may the memory of the just be blessed, has interpreted that it is equivalent to the word emet, meaning truth. Okay, so Radak puts these two possible meanings up at the front, but he doesn't agree. <coughs> the Radak, like most modern scholars, does not think that it has an actual translatable meaning. For myself, I say it is not a significant word, and it is to be interpreted as having the meaning lift up of the musical accompaniment from the passage, cast up, cast up, solu, solu, drachecha, right? Cast up, cast up the way. So the, the word sela is very similar to this word solu from, the, from Isaiah. And in Isaiah, it means... Like uh, it, it it means to cast up, cast up the way, right? And so he's saying this means, all right, start playing, playing the music, signifying that at this point where the word is mentioned and read, there was the raising of the sound of the music. And the proof is in the fact in the fact that this word is not found except in the book of Psalms and in the prayer of Habakkuk, which was a song accompanied by music, as is also written there. 
for the chief musician on my stringed instruments. In other words, right, this this word in the whole Bible only appears in musical poems. Wow. And, and really mostly only in the book of Psalms. And so Radak says it's it just is a it, it means play the musical instruments. Mishka. It's it strikes me as you're speaking that it would signify some sort of change in in the musical tone the key perhaps uh could change certainly you could go from a major to a minor mode um as you're reading what is good positive or what is negative and that it's a not uncommon thing to happen in music and uh it as you're talking about it as a musical element i really hear Yes, you would change from a major to a minor. And then, whoopee, we're back to the major because they all end up in some kind of a positive uh, mode. And we we uh, see major and minor in our own way of thinking of being happy or sad music. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. Obviously, the Book of Psalms did not come with an accompanying musical notes. And so we we just don't know. A lot of this has been lost to history. Right. And mm -hmm. I think that your imagination of that is beautiful and very likely. Although there are a lot of times where I feel like the word Sela appears where I don't feel like there's necessarily a change of tone. Like it sometimes it's hard to know what change of tone or what what is the emotional impact of a pause there that the that that is trying to what is the affect of it and it might and and like you're saying the change from major to minor it could be like okay we've read these verses and now there's a bunch of instrumentals and like that means that you're supposed to contemplate the meaning of those verses for longer Right. Like, because that's what you're thinking about when the instrumental start, like, or they could be very short instrumental music. Like it could be like a crash of cymbals. And it might be that there was a whole tradition uh, of what music music went with which psalm. But all we get is the one word Sela that doesn't tell us anything about the different tra musical traditions that accompanied it. There's a, a lot been written about sort of the sanctuary of silence, right? We get a ton of descriptions of how to do the sacrifices in the temple that are contained in the Torah and no, no words that accompanied those sacrifices. But other contemporary uh, sacrifice manuals that we have from the ancient Near East do in fact have and here you say this prayer. And a lot of the Psalms we know were used in the temple as prayers. Yeah. And so we have this book of Psalms and we have this silent service described in the book of Leviticus mostly. And a lot has been written on how do these come together? What does it in fact mean? I don't have a good answer to that, and neither do the the scholars who are way more learned and smarter than I am. But it is something that people do talk about. Uh, and there, there's a uh, there's a book I think called The Sanctuary of Silence. And I did take a class in rabbinical school comparing uh, Leviticus to the Book of Psalms, which was a very interesting class. The other, I just wanted to add. This is not necessarily just instrumental. I mean, people sing uh, yes. in, in different modes. And the modes, what we have no clue what the mode was uh, in our musical language, right. which didn't actually get codified until basically Bach. Yeah, I sort of imagine a, a chorus, but so many of the Psalms do talk about uh specific instruments that it's probably a mix of instrumental and vocal um, right. music. And also how cool would it be to hear these Psalms all set to their original, 
the music that was used, you know? All right. Uh, is there somebody who would like to read the right hand column? And then we'll we'll especially think about the the way that this that this translation feels different from Robert Alter's translation. I'll do it. All right, Marv. No, this is Marv. Yeah, Marv, you got okay. it. I've been called a lot of things, but art is okay. <laughs> a Psalm of David, when he fled from the face of Absalom, his son. Adonai, how many are my adversaries? So many rise up against me. So many may say to me, there is no deliverance for him in God. Selah. But you, Adonai, are a shield for me, my glory, the one who lifts up my head. My voice cries out to Adonai, who will respond to me from God's holy mountain, Selah. Now I lay me down to sleep, and when I wake, for Adonai upholds me. I shall not fear the thousands who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, Adonai, deliver me, my God. You have smitten every one of my enemies on the cheek. You have thrashed the terrible ones in the teeth. Deliverance for God belongs to God. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. Thank you. No. So, uh, any immediate reactions? What jumps out at you? I find it very wordy. Lots of words. Oh yeah, yeah, de definitely. Uh, R Rabbi Richard Levy's translation. I think in part because he's trying very hard not to refer to God by pronouns. Uh, it the the circumlocution that you have to do to be able to do that and also have a a faithful translation uh, does sometimes feel a little wordy. Well, sometimes extra words add a, a different dimension and uh, provide a little bit more explanation than just the, the shortened one. Although the shortened ones are good, sometimes additional words, again, provide uh, more explanation and a little bit more depth. Yeah. Any other... Anything else? Yeah, Gary. I don't know where the phrase, no, I lay me down to sleep comes from. <laughs> I know I've, I've heard it, but I don't know where it comes from. Yeah, so it's a it's a traditional bedtime prayer for young children. Um, <laughs> now I lay me down to sleep. To sleep. I pray the Lord I my soul to keep. To keep. Uh, if and, I die uh, before I wake. Should I die before I wake, I pray with the Lord my soul to take. To take. Yeah. Um, and the reason why he chose to translate, uh, I lay down and I sleep, right? Ani shachavti va'ishana, using the words of that very commonly known <clears throat> child's bedtime prayer is because when he read through this psalm and was working on translating it, he felt like David might have been using it as a bedtime prayer. And he is not the only one to think this. Psalm 3 is actually included in the traditional Jewish bedtime prayer ritual, which is called Kriyat Shema Alamita. I, I put that in here where it says liturgical uses of Psalm, of Psalm 3. All of Psalm 3 is recommended in the traditional nighttime recitation of the Shema. So, you know, it's traditional to recite the Shema morning and night in our daily prayer service. And in that prayer service, it comes with blessings that surround it. And a lot of people have the custom of saying the Shema before they go to sleep, just in case they die. Uh, at night that the Shema should be the last thing that they said and that's connected also to the story of Rabbi Akiva who 
as he was being martyred, saying the words of the Shema. So that and 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 a lot of there are a lot of stories of Jewish martyrs who went off to their death singing the Shema, including many in the Holocaust in our own in our own time. And all of this to say, right, the the traditional approach is not just to say the Shema, but to say the Shema accompanied by uh, blessings. And the and we don't do the traditional like evening service blessings on your pillow, but there there are some recommended psalms and prayers to say along with the Shema. And Psalm 3 is one of them. And so, in fact, this psalm was used, has been used by Jewish people and by others as a nighttime prayer. And so he wanted to elevate that by translating the words, I lie down and sleep, in a way that would that would remind any sort of English-speaking reader of that uh of that uh um nighttime prayer. Uh, did you say me yeah oh okay um i'm i'm seeing a couple places where the uh where robert alter uses the word rescue in verse three and rescue in verse nine whereas rabbi levy uh uses deliver or deliverance and and there to me there is a difference in those words that rescue is okay i've got you but deliverance is taking you somewhere too nice beautiful right i the way i understood that difference is a little different from the way you did i understood that difference as rabbi levy is really trying to to read this psalm sort of spiritually in the way we might use the psalm right like anybody who uses this psalm might be praying for deliverance but robert alter is translating the psalm in its sort of context where david might be like specifically asking to be saved in a particular moment in his life um but i love what you said about uh rescue versus deliverance that to be rescued is from something but to be delivered is to something that is a beautiful, beautiful comment. Uh, Mark. Uh, line eight is interesting. Uh, rescue me, my God, for you strike all my foes on the cheek, the teeth of the wicked you smash. In other words, he, he would admonish his foes who may not be so terrible, but the wicked he really uh, punishes. Great. So one way to see this is that the foes are one category of people and the wicked are another category of people. Another way to understand that verse is that the foes and the wicked are the same. Hmm. And it's the it's the strike on the cheek that is smashing the teeth. Uh. It's one, one action. But I, I actually think you could read it both ways, right? And one of the things that's really sort of uh common to uh to the Hebrew poetry in the Psalms is that you'll have uh two uh two phrases on either half of a verse that that just change a couple of the words but it's the repetition of the idea and those are supposed to be both uh showing the sameness and the difference between those words you're, you're supposed to read the biblical the parallelism in a way that both accentuates the 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 fact that these are synonyms and also that shows yeah foes and the wicked might not be in fact the same right these are this is two different ways of thinking nice uh mishka um, I was always, not that I've studied Psalms at all in any way, that there were parallel lines, that every line in a Psalm had a, uh, was two sentences, for want of a better word, um, and that they were 
parallel in some ways, and then they were in opposition in other ways. And that clearly comes through um, as I read uh, in, in uh, Levy's translation for line four, but you ought and I are a shield for me, my glory, the one who lifts up my head. That is two lines that reflect upon each other and that there are uh, more, uh, well, one is kind of supporting the other, another way perhaps to say it, but there are places where they are uh, in in some form of opposite opposition, um, there's yeah. there's that. No question, no question. I think if you didn't, if you didn't you know, get it right the first time, the second time you'll get it. Yeah, I think one of the strong characteristics of biblical poetry is this use of parallelism. Uh, Gary, my reaction was that the focus on the cheeks and the teeth is that the psalmist is complaining about people saying bad things about him and so right. it's you know, it's in opposition to speaking that it, you get your mouth smacked that's right his complaint is his complaint is they're talking nasty things about me they're saying god's not gonna save him right they're saying they're rising up and verbally and verbally talking against him uh, in, in verse three. And so you're right that there is sort of a sense of justice. If the problem is that they're saying nasty things, the answer should be that they get their teeth knocked out. Um, yeah, nice. All right. Uh, yeah, let's read. And getting their teeth knocked out mean they can't really talk. Right. Punishment fits the crime. Mm. Yeah. All right. Let's go to uh, James Hamilton Jr.'s translation on the right hand side of page four. Um, we've looked at him before. He's uh, he's an evangelical Christian who who sets up his own book by putting the, he's also doing comparative translation, right? He sets up his own book where he has the traditional uh, translation from the Christian Standard Bible on one side of the page, and then he gives his own translation on the, on the other side of the page. So we're not going to read the Christian Standard Bible one together, but it is there on the left-hand side of, of this page. We're going to read the right-hand side. Um, notice uh, quickly, right? The Christian Standard Bible starts uh, Psalm with the verse, uh, I don't, Lord, how my foes increase. That's verse one. But James Hamilton Jr., our evangelical translation uh, translator, he goes back to the Hebrew scripture version. And I don't think that's an accident, right? I think that the, that he is, he, when he did his research, he definitely was looking at the Hebrew Bible. And I think, I mean, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I think he sees himself as, in some sense, uh, trying to restore an originalism to the translation, uh, which I think connects to his uh, to his theology. And again, this this translation is a Christian theological, uh, uh, translation in, in kind of a similar way to the way that Rabbi Levy is trying to do a spiritual or theological translation from a Jewish perspective. All right. Uh, somebody who hasn't read, would they like to read James Hamilton Jr.'s uh, translation here? I will. Yeah. Reverend McDonald. A Psalm of David. When he fled from before Absalom, his son, O oh, Yahweh, how many adversaries multiplied, many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God, Selah. But you, O oh Yahweh, are the shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. With my voice to Yahweh, I called. 
And he answered me from the mountains of his holiness. Selah. I lay down and I slept. I woke because Yahweh sustained me. I will not fear because of the myriads of people who round about set upon me. Rise up, O Yahweh, save me, O my God, for you strike all at enmity with me on the jaw, the teeth of the wicked you shatter. To Yahweh belongs salvation. May your blessing be on your people. Selah. So what do you think? To me? I... Yeah, yeah, you, James, yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> one, one thing that really struck me was his his description of God. His, it, I mean, why why did he use the 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 um I don't I, I I just think that Adonai would have been a much better translation. <laughs> so I don't know what he was trying to do in that, but um he wasn't being as interfaith minded as he might have been. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that's true. I don't think his intention was to be interfaith mind. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I'm specific. I I'm specifically intrigued by verse three. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. What do you make of that? <laughs> that's the bad day. You love option. Yeah, right. So first of all, when we go back to the Hebrew, Rabim Omrim Lenafshi, Nefesh means soul, right? Now, Nefesh can also mean person or body. Uh, and in a lot in most of these translations, they nefesh in this context just means me. And when you read through Psalms, the psalmist often uses the word nafshi to just mean I. It's a fancy way of referring to yourself, right? But to choose to translate it as soul, I think is trying to make a theological point about the salvation of the soul. Hmm. At least that's how I read it. Uh, Gary. I, I forget who was commenting on the difference between rescue and deliverance. Uh, but here in the Christian translation, it becomes salvation. Right. Right. Where so all of those words are synonyms in some sense, but here he makes it very explicit that what we're talking about is salvation. And he's not the only one, right? The Christian Standard Bible also does, uh, also uses salvation. Um, although, you know, not all the Christian translations do, like these two that are on page three. Well, the, the one on the right is a Christian one that that then it's using the word deliverance. But here, definitely, right, salvation is uh, it means something different in a, in a certain sense in a Christian context than it does. Right. We, we like whether you read this as uh, rescue from a particular moment of danger in David's life or whether you read it as. The psalmist is using that moment of David's life to write a psalm that's more universal, that fits to anybody who feels like they're in any kind of distress, whether it's physical or spiritual. And then the salvation, the and then the deliverance is moving towards something, right? Salvation is a way of describing that deliverance, which has connotation of sort of... Um, after death or like uh, the, you know, and it doesn't have to mean that, right? Like to say I've been saved is also salvific, right? But to use specifically the word salvation, uh, it does, it does bring that into it. Nice. One comment more. Yeah. Abba. Right. The reading the Richard Levy, Verse eight, arise out of nigh, uh, deliver me, my God. You have smitten every one of my enemies, uh, enemies on the cheek. You have trashed the terrible ones in the teeth. And I can't remember who can't made remember. 
the comment that it sounds like two different, th I think it was Mishka said this, that it sounds like two different things. One is you smite people on the cheek and the other one is you're talking trash about me. So there's these two different things. Whereas with the Christian one by Hamilton, I get the distinct feeling that this is more like a knockdown, drag out fight and that there's no distinction between these two for you strike all at enmity with, with me on the jaw clock, the teeth of the wicked you shatter. It's sort of like a um, act and consequence. It doesn't seem to, to separ separate the two parts. It seems like the same thing, just the quality of the hitting me on the, on the jaw. Yeah, it's interesting the way that like different phrases in the translation lend themselves more easily to thinking of them uh, of those two sticks, those two lines in the in the verse as one action or two actions. And I, I think, mm. right? It, it's it's very interesting to me, like the sense that you get from the translation. And I also wonder, you know, I tried. And Brie, Brie uh, very faithfully um, typed up uh, many of the uh, these psalms for me, uh, and we tried very hard to replicate the uh, the formatting that the that the that the translator used, and that's part of why it looks like uh, Richard Levy is is so much longer is. In order to get the formatting right, I, uh, you know, on the page, like he just he had shorter. It, it it's not that there are that many more words in this psalm that it goes so far on the page. Is that the his lines are shorter? He's he's taking each phrase. Uh, anyway, I I do think that it it might also have to do with the line breaks that the way that we that we like visually uh look at the at the poem like does that bring something to our heads all right i want to look at some of the some of the intertexts so first of all uh we talked about how psalm 3 is part of the traditional liturgy for kriyat shema alamita the the nice the nighttime recitation of the shema and if you have that custom of saying the shema before bed i wonder if for the next week or so you might add in psalm 3 and see what that does for you um, spiritually. Uh, so the the last verse of this psalm, uh, verse 9, is, of course, uh, repeated many times in our liturgy. Uh, and I, 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 I showed you this verse is contained in an anthology of verses from psalms about the redemption of the people Israel. And... Uh, in 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 the morning service, it's associated with verses Psalm forty six verse eight, Psalm eighty four verse thirteen, Psalm twenty verse ten. Each of these, in in their original context, each verse uh, means something different in its own context. Context, but we take them all, all four of these verses, stick them next to each other, and they are in our morning service. Uh, and then when you read them, deliverance is yours, Adonai. May your blessings be upon your people forever. Adonai Tzvot is with us. The God of Jacob is our protection. Adonai Tzvot, blessed are those who trust in you. Adonai, deliver us. Surely our sovereign will respond to us in the hour of our calling, right? So this is an anthology of verses, but they all are connected thematically with this idea of deliverance and uh, and protection and blessing and uh, and and and. You know, if you've heard this verse, Ladonai Hayushua Lamchabir Khatecha Sela, you probably heard it uh more likely in this uh grouping of four verses that are not actually all from the same psalm, because liturgically in the Jewish uh liturgy, we don't really read Psalm three as a whole in our prayer service, although like I said, we it is common to do it. Uh, in the nighttime Shema, that same set of verses is found in our Havdalah ritual recited at the conclusion of Shabbat. 
Right? And those verses are also found in the Slichot prayers on the minor fast days. And the there is a passage in the Talmud that describes Psalm 3 being used as part of a consecration uh, consecration ceremony to the uh, 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 to an addition of the city of Jerusalem, and so the the Psalm three has been used as con in a consecration ceremony, which, which would be interesting. Like if we were going to dedicate a new wing of our synagogue, we might turn to this passage from the Talmud Bavli from Shavuot fifteen b to ask. What, what psalms might we say in this dedication ceremony? And there we would find that Psalm 3 is one of them. Mishka. Um, I'm struck by the fact that in uh, the text, uh, uh, line 4, Adonai is written out with vowels. Uh, in the text. Under normal circumstances, and I don't know where normal is, Yud Hey Vav Hey is not does not have vowels, and yes, as a result, we don't pronounce it. And in so not pronouncing that, it, the truth is that in in every in every Chumash and Tanakh, the word Yud Hey Vav Hey is printed with vowels, and the vowels that are printed are the vowels for Adonai. So you can see right the the Aleph of Adonai has a a chataf patach, the, the 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 that special ah that's really supposed to be uh, a shva, but because it's an aleph, it can't be a shva. But be, if it's a yud, then it is a shva. And then the hay has the what would have been the dalid. The dalid has a an o vowel, so you see that the hay has an o vowel. And then the nun has a kamatz adonai ah. Uh, I and so the vav here has a kamatz, right? The ah sound. So and actually, this is part of the reason why people get the idea that it's Yehovah, because if you were yeah. going to if you were going to read it, that's how it uh, that's how it reads. So Jehovah is not that's that's yeah, just yeah. using our Jewish uh, Adonai vowels yeah. and uh, and putting them on. We don't read it that way. We say Adonai. And the vowels are supposed to remind you to do that. Now, a few times in scripture, you have the word Adonai followed by yud heh vav -He, And in those cases, the vowels under yud heh vav -He actually change. <laughs> and the custom is to, to, to read those words Adonai Elohim, right? So, And you'll hear that often in, 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 in Haftarot. So there are several cases in uh in the book of prophets where you have that uh adonai elohim uh and uh and then the vowels under the yud hey vav hey are the vowels that you would put under the word elohim so yeah. I, I encourage you to look for that it's not true that we don't put vowels uh under that word we do uh we just use the vowels to remind ourselves to say the word adonai instead of instead of to read that word, which we don't, we, which we don't do. Um, I was going to say as a second part that with the vowels, you get uh, a word that gets translated into, uh, into uh, Yahweh. And from there, it gets uh, further, not translated, but used as Yahweh. And from there you get uh, Jehovah. Right. It's actually, Jehovah. It's very explicitly that's that's where they got that. That's how it that's how it happened. Um, but we don't we don't tend to pronounce it that way. But right. I do hope that you all read the um the passage from 2 Samuel and that reading the story of Absalom and David fighting helps to contextualize this psalm in its in the visceral nature of its uh, of the fear and the violence, right? And I just I just brought a couple of verses from that. Uh, someone came and told David the loyalty of the men of Israel is veered toward Avshalom, right? How people are following your son. Whereupon David said to all the courtiers who were with him in Jerusalem, let's go. 
right? We can't stay here. We're going to die if we stay here. None of us will escape. We must get away quickly or he will soon overtake us and bring disaster upon us and put the city of the sword. So he, he flees from Jerusalem. The king's courtiers said to the king, uh, whatever our lord the king decides, your servants are ready. David, meanwhile, went up the slope of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and he walked barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and wept as they went up. So they're fleeing from uh, the city of David, which is on one of the hills of Jerusalem. And they're fleeing out toward the west, uh, toward the Jordan, uh, toward Jericho, uh, uh, and, the, uh, and up the Mount of Olives. Sorry, that's east. <laughs> Fleeing east uh, toward Jericho, up the Mount of Olives, uh, and um, uh, and that is the moment that tradition says, like while he's climbing the Mount of Olives, Harazetim, uh, and crying. That's when he says this psalm in its original moment. Um, all right, let's read. Uh, we've run out of time. All right. Well, oh, no. by associating this psalm with a specific event in David's life, the poet seems to want us to understand enemies literary, liter literally as people who are pursuing us in order to defeat us. Many of us have such people in our lives, though we are often confused as to how real their en enmity is and how much might be delusional on our part. Very often in the book of Psalms, it is more useful to understand enemies as forces within us that can threaten our dreams or plans. To apply this psalm to our own lives, it is useful to consider situations where we have felt pursued, as David does by his son Absalom, or turned against by people we love, or by part of our own bodies, right? So you, you might read this as, my own body is, is an enemy. Sometimes our feelings of betrayal are tricks of the mind, not grounded in reality. In any case, it is important to confront our feeling of being pursued, if not by human beings, then by obstacles that are interfering with our accomplishing what we feel our purpose is in the world. What are those obstacles? Sometimes it is useful to list them, both strategize how to overcome them, as well as to pray to God for insight and confidence. You, Adonai, are a shield for me, my glory, the one who lifts up my head. When our head is lifted, we can see more clearly and hear more clearly how God may be responding to us. When we were little, we may well have said, now I lay me down to sleep when we went to bed. <laughs> the comfort we felt then and the confidence that we will awake is present for us now. And after times of prayer and listening and rest, along with David, we may be able to arise and face the obstacles of our life with our fears diminished, able to say with confidence and surety, Selah. Which I just think is a beautiful, uh, beautiful um, spiritual application of this psalm and I'll close. I found a, a friend of mine gave me this book at the end of my first unit of CPE, at the end of my first unit of clinical pastoral education. And it's called Psalm Songs by Gaia Aronoff Bernstein. And sometimes I will close the class by reading. These are, uh, she wrote uh, 150 like modern poems that are loosely interpretations of the Psalms. Uh, she's not trying to do a translation. So it's, you know, that, that I'm not going to bring them often, but every once in a while. And so I'd like to close with this uh, Psalm 3. Oh God, I am overwhelmed by the demons in my heart, at my heels, after me, taunting me, threatening me, aiming at me. But then I sense you here with me. I get out of bed, lift my head, face my life, knowing you know I'm surrounding, I'm surrounded. You get them, kill those bastards, break their teeth, bless us, Sela. Mm -hmm. All right, thank mm -hmm. you. I'll see you next week. And uh, I haven't, uh, today's my first day back, so I haven't um, done next week's uh, sheets yet, but you'll get it sometime over the course of the week. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Rabbi, can I have you for a minute?
afterwards do you have time